How many people react, you know, recognize you that you are from the United States? They, uh, the initial response is they get a little bit uh, shocked. Uh, they can't, they even make a gesture like, oh, you're not Russian, you're American. I've had people be angry, I've had people be very happy, I've had people being shocked, and some people just don't really care. When I lived in Irkutsk, uh, I was accused of being a spy. The man spoke English and he said, why are you in Irkutsk, so far into Russia? And it seemed a little bit strange to them that I was so deep into Russia. Just like you saw in that introduction, I will be going over the video that I made with The Real Reporter. It has gotten over 2 million views. I'm very proud of it. I want to talk about some things as we watch it more in detail, some things that you guys maybe didn't know. And for anybody who hasn't watched the video, I hope you enjoy it. It's truly a great video, in my opinion. So this is the first episode, of course, that we filmed in Sliudanka. So let's go. I'm going to be honest. I think that nothing has changed since I've been here. I don't see it. The gas prices haven't gone up, but I know that's by law, but everything in the stores are there. Um, the people seem happy. No sunset. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that there's a limit to how much a human can take. And if they reach that limit, then they will protest. Well, here's the backstory. A couple of months ago, someone left a comment under my video saying he's an American war veteran who'd found a new home in Irkutsk region, Siberia. There's always been many expats living in Moscow, but deep Siberia, that's rare. So I checked out the guy's channel. It turned out he's an ex-Marine who'd fought in Afghanistan, and he moved to Russia not long ago after the war in Ukraine started. So I traveled all the way to the remote Siberian village where Daniel Castellon settled in to see who he really is and what on earth he's doing in the middle of nowhere, Russia. Picture. All right, so by the way, guys, I, I'm, I'm not an ex-Marine. Constantine doesn't know, but like Marines are always going to be Marines. I'm a United States Marine veteran and I'm proud of it. Now, another thing is I didn't just move to Siberia. I was actually traveling as a tourist. And I think he says a couple of times that I moved to Russia, but no, that is not true. I actually was a tourist there in the very beginning. And I was living there as a tourist throughout my entire time there. Just have to clear, clear that up for you guys. I didn't move to Russia. For this, it's April 2022, and the biggest military conflict in Europe since World War II has just erupted. The U.S. tells all its citizens in Russia to immediately leave the country because supposedly the world is once again on the brink of nuclear Armageddon. Meanwhile, an undaunted American traveler, Daniel Castellan, gets a one-way ticket to Russia. He settles in a small, unassuming village in Siberia and becomes an unlikely witness to some of the country's most dramatic events sanctions war and mobilization when the mobilization started you would be able to see tanks and raw material heading towards the west daniel a foreigner who previously served in the u.s marine corps actually blends in well on the frontier of rural russia his background gives him a unique perspective on how things have been playing out in russia over the past year i have no side in this even though i live in russia by the way i just don't see ukraine winning Right now we're in the outskirts of Sludanka. Uh, we're just gonna walk down an average street in Sludanka um, and show you how the houses look. For me, this is one of the most beautiful looks. The the windows is a signature of Russian uh, houses. Okay, the people living here, I think it's very uh, rural, as in people work in the in the mines. People work in the train station. It's a very kind of pass by sort of town. You have that small town feeling, bakeries, small cafes, uh, small shops. It's very, it's that kind of town. Yeah, so for me, Sludanka is like what America, we call like flyover states. It's like a flyover city, right? It's flyover town, flyover village. Not a lot of things to do if you're not Russian, if you're not a Russian and you can't 
you can't just come there and get a job and you know flourish it's a very hard town to to just start up on but for me it was something that i needed to do because well this is where Xenia's father's from this is why i actually decided to go there i lived in the city but i i enjoyed the town a lot more let's go we have a kfc here uh now in this kfc you might find uh, a different menu but Nonetheless, we have a KFC, King Food Sliudanka. I'm going to be honest, I think that nothing has changed since I've been here. I don't see it. The gas prices haven't gone up, but I know that's by law, but everything in the stores are there. What you don't see that's on the shelf, it's actually hidden right behind you. It's world famous around the world. It's Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola finds uh, its way back into the yeah. Russian market no matter what. No matter what. It's also interesting that they kind of keep it low, you know, don't advertise it, you know, as much. Yeah. It's on the floor. If you want it, you know where to find it. It's, it's, it's kind of like this, like uh, you're walking, you're walking, and you scoop it up, and you buy it. It's very low, low key. For me, it's just always weird, you know, the, you had all these content creators when the sanctions started going into stores and stuff like nothing changed in stores. In fact, we started seeing more Russian products and uh, it was fascinating though. What did leave immediately in small towns was Coca-Cola. The Coca-Colas that were on the ground, once they left, they didn't come back for a long time. Uh, you'll learn later why and how we get our products in Russia, even though they're sanctions, but it took a long time for us to actually get Western products back. And, you know, in that store, you saw how packed it was. And this is in a Siberian town. You guys have to understand that people making videos in Russia, in big cities, they'll never feel sanctions because they're so close to the to the food chain of things, you know. For us living in Siberia, it actually got a little bit rough, but we didn't really notice it because, you know, life continued and there was other things we had to worry about. The people seem happy. There hasn't been any, if things were really bad, I know protests are illegal, but they would be protesting. If life was miserable, humans can only take so much. There's been plenty of demonstrations in Russia that have been shut down, but at least they go try because they're fed up or they just have different views. But in my town, nobody has protested. Everything has been calm. I have to clarify this as well, because a lot of people were saying, oh, this American is saying Russians should protest or something like this. No, what I was saying is that humanity, even if it's the Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, you can only whip a civilization so much until they actually do come out in force. The fact that I never saw massive protests means that, you know, Russians were actually not as miserable as the West would like them to be. Guys, this is not me saying go protest. It was just me stating the obvious. When uh, you bend something, it can break. It will reach its limit. And the Russians are the same. It's just how it works. This is not uh, me guessing. This is just me saying reality. Here's the fruits. Look at how much fruits they have. Mandarins, all types of apples. His store has always had everything, even through the sanctions. Tell him I've seen the store has been full, and I've lived here for a year, and every time we come, it's full. And has it affected him at all? No sanctions. <laughs> <laughs> California exports a lot of avocados from Mexico, and uh, not a lot of countries can grow av av avocados. So seeing it here, in his store so fresh, it blows my mind. Chile, California, Argentina. California is not friends with us. Where is the conference? It is written about production, Belarus. When the Belarus conference, they were always California. Our gas will be used, but through these countries. If you take Kitai, you will take Iran through the Caspian Sea or something. Iran through Turkey. I'm just saying that. But still, this gas will not come. Well, you can see that the gas will not come. Well, it wasn't my intention to stay, but... Guys, I, I, 
this man described the way the sanctions were working perfectly and it's exactly how it goes you know third party countries will buy or sell different things either from buy from russia to sell to other countries or sell into russia a country that has not sanctioned russia so say the united states continues to sell avocados it'll sell it to turkey turkey will sell it to the, to the russians and the russians will sell to the turkish the turkish will sell to the americans you know this is just how it's always worked and um you know when you have a small town who is still getting products it says a lot about how easy it is to go around sanctions i was getting food in siberia from california it's it's comedy my heart finally changed when i decided to stay because i am in a relationship When you have someone, you can con connect with someone in a place that's brand new to you. This place has become my home. How do people react? You know, recognize you that you are from the United States. They, uh, the initial response is they get a little bit uh, shocked. Uh, they can They even make a gesture like, oh. You're not Russian, you're American. I've had people be angry, I've had people be very happy, I've had people be in shock and some people just don't really care. When I lived in Irkutsk, uh, I was accused of being a spy. The man spoke English and he said, "Why are you in Irkutsk, so far into Russia?" And it seemed a little bit strange to them that I was so deep into Russia. I was actually attacked in Irkutsk uh, by these three guys. They spoke a little bit of English. I was fishing in the Angara River and, uh, you know, they just were drinking and they started talking to me. They heard me speak English and I could be something like Spiona or sp something like this. And I was like, oh, spy. I'm pretty sure they're calling me a spy. I had a bag with my fishing stuff and they ripped it. Uh, they chased me. I didn't want any trouble. I, I knew I could fight them by myself because they were drunk but you know in russia you don't want those kind of problems and uh i had already been in a relationship with senia like i mentioned in the video and i didn't want to ruin that so actually i just ran it wasn't worth it senia huh where are you from oh uh, los angeles california california da uh, uh, you like it here i love it I love it. Tell her that I love it. How long have you been living here? Uh, yeah, 10 months, 10 months. And what do you do for a living? For a living? Oh, well, I'm a military retired veteran, I guess. I, that's what I am. But I'm trying to get my citizenship to work. Uh -huh. I don't think she would understand. У него пенсия от американского правительства уже есть. Он служил в армии. Но он хочет получить гражданство и работать. В России? Да. Понятно. Ну, Средянка хороша. Воздух очень хороший. Before joining, and another thing here in this moment, Constantine says, I'm living off a pension, which got a lot of people wondering, like, wait, he's living comfortably in Russia. No, you know, I brought cash, I brought my savings because there's no such thing as taking your money to Russia and having it deposited. Of course, I have a disability, uh, disabilities that, uh, are covered by the United States government veterans affairs, but uh, this money doesn't exist in Russia. I don't have this money in, in Russia. I don't live off of this money. Um, later on in the next video, I will talk about the kind of jobs that I've had in Russia since I arrived, but that's just something that a lot of people got confused with. Um, it's just very interesting that after this video, people were writing me, hey, I'm also a veteran. How do I move to Russia? How can I move with my uh, social security? Like, there's no such thing as that, guys. Nothing. In the military, Daniel had a troubled childhood as he grew up in one of Los Angeles' toughest suburbs, San Fernando Valley. Growing up in a, in a town like Silmar, it's uh, very heavy with Mexicans. You grow up in the gangs and stuff like this. I think 
To other countries, it's taboo, but for us, it's very normal to join the uh, organized crime. An assault with a deadly weapon shot in yesterday's crime spree caught the robbers in action. Open the next one. Open the next one. My family is an immigrant family, so I'm Mexican-American. Nobody before me had gone to school. Nobody before me had gone to the military. So I went to the recruiting office very young at 18, and I signed up to join the Marine Corps. 2010 and 2011, I was in Afghanistan just doing what i just said looking for landmines and and fighting every day you have to go out and see how far you can get until the taliban shoot at you and what my job was go in the front of everybody and look for contact go in hot 50 meters east and it was at night uh a lot of taliban came and they started lighting the fields around us on fire and then they started more uh, shooting mortars into our position and you know you have machine gun positions outside uh, start fighting, fighting them back. I got one of them. I, I traveled with a, with a flag that my mom gave me, and it survived that battle that we were in. It wasn't the toughest day, but it was certainly one of the most meaningful days because um, my mom sent me to war with a flag, and I was intending to bring it back, and I did. When I say my mom sent me with the flag into war, you know, it's like a Spartan mother or a wife. Uh, the Mexican people, it's a very proud people. I joined the military in the United States, not only for myself, but for my family. I think that it's important for a man to serve the borders in which he's eating from, you know, like I don't bite the hand that feeds me. It wasn't about politics. It was just about a sense of duty. Uh, again, I'm a proud United States Marine Corps veteran. And uh, that's all I have to say about that. And the reason why I fly the Mexican flag and not the American flag, it's because my mother, you know, this is a, I travel the world. I go to Russia and the flag represents my mother. Um, a lot of people get a little bit offended about that, but I'm a proud American, but I'm even more proud to be my mother's son. And I don't care what anybody has to say about that. from a military experience, what can you tell me about how this uh, current war between Russia and Ukraine is uh, being fought? I have no side in this, even though I live in Russia, by the way. I just don't see Ukraine winning. They're doing all the bad moves. The way that Ukraine has been fighting it in, in a conventional way, I thought was a very bad idea. You don't want to go conventional war against a powerhouse like Russia. So when they build trenches and all these things, building trenches, hiding in buildings, it's only a bloodbath against Ukraine because they're putting all their eggs in one basket. I don't think that the Americans want Ukraine to win because they're not giving them what they actually need. Germany has now said yes to Leopard 2 tank delivery. It's very significant substantively on the battlefield. America is preparing to follow suit and send its own Abrams tanks. Tanks do nothing. Not against a good, a, a superior air force and a superior artillery. Russia is the king. Artillery is king. You can give them all the tanks they want, but Ukraine is not supported by infantry, artillery, or an air force. All the good stuff is on the other side. NATO has to actually get involved in the war with boots on the ground if they want to win the war, which is talking about World War Three. Yeah, and this is another part that I predicted all these things a year ago, and uh, a lot of the stuff that I say in this video actually comes true. Um, but one of the things that bothered me is that Russian people watching this video were saying, hey, look, he wants NATO to fight against Russia. No, I said, uh, as a military brain, as a military person, I said, if they even wanted to have a chance at fighting against Russia, the, the NATO had to join the war. Right. This is just, again, realistically speaking, because using Ukraine as a pawn and just sending them weapons that they can't operate without the proper air force and uh, artillery, they're going to lose anyways. So this was just my uh, two cents that I put in there. Right. That's just how it is. My predictions for the war on record. And even if you don't put this, but um, I think it'll take three to four. Uh, major battles, and by major battles, I mean uh, a place like where they lose catastrophically from 50 to 100,000 men, where they really commit, 
uh, Ukrainians like to do that. They like to apparently they like to fight to the last man. There's about four rails that were about to go under, and when the mobilization started, you would be able to see tanks and raw material heading towards the west. It happened around. Yeah, guys, um, this is another important part where I'm talking about major battles. When I filmed this with the real reporter, I don't think that he understood the meaning of a major battle. But now, since uh, the Battle of Bakhmut and the Battle of Divka, of Abdivka has been pronounced major battles on Wikipedia, he starts to realize, oh, maybe these predictions are going to come true because it's only been two since the recording of that video. And the next two are going to happen within this year and the next. And perhaps the conflict will be over. I may be wrong by one major battle, but that's that's fair enough, right? Major battles, major casualties are what make a war end. Um, you don't remember small skirmishes. No, you always remember the big name ones, the Battle of the Bulge, uh, Iwo Jima. You know, there's these big battles that change the course of a war. So this is something really important that I brought up in this video. Uh, and it's all coming true. Around September, October for this town, and the people went in support for it. If there was anything against it, I'm guessing, like I said, a lot of people would have uh, gone against it. And also, I see the same people in town. A lot of young men who hold jobs in stores, a lot of young men that never didn't leave. You would hear stories about people fleeing the country to Georgia, and we're very close to Mongolia. Dobry den, my friend. Can you ask him for me because I fish shuka? Can you ask him where he catches the shuka? I fish all the time. I go outside and walk and I get lost on purpose. There's many forests behind the house. There's lakes. There's Baikal. I like to be with nature. I suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm diagnosed for combat trauma. So in Los Angeles, there's too much noise. A lot of sudden noise can affect me. Uh, I get flashbacks. When I go out there, it's just me and the birds and, and whatever is in nature. I find peace. They live inside the water, a lot of uh, bugs. If the lake is healthy, then it has bugs because other fish can eat this. I can go fishing anywhere in the world. If I would have left Los Angeles and driven somewhere, I could have found a lake, I could have found a river. But you don't choose the place you love. When I traveled here to, to Siberia, to, to Irkutsk, and I found Sliudanka, it called to me. Growing up as a warrior and going to war, I feel uh, closer to, to myself when I'm far away. And this is as far as I could go. Yeah, guys. I hope you understand the warrior inside me when I join the military and I go on campaign so far away from home. You get used to just going far. You get used to even going far of your own heart. Even if you don't travel, you do miserable things. And you grow comfortable uh, being in misery, deploying or training. You feel happiness in misery. You feel happiest when you're far from your family. Just It's a mental state that I go into. So when I traveled to Russia, this was what I wanted. I said, I'll go to Siberia and I'll be far from humanity and I'll feel happier with myself inside. Uh, and in this part of the, of the video, I just hoped that people would understand that I was doing these things. I did this to try to find myself far from home. But in the end, like I'll say, you'll see in the video, I actually didn't need that anymore. I felt happy where I was. That became my home and I no longer needed to run away and be far from my family to feel happy because I had found a new happiness. So I'm gonna go back a little bit so I can re-say that part and you could hear it. To myself when I'm far away, and this is as far as I could go. 
in America, you feel that there's over, an overwhelming amount of institutions that are trying to assimilate you. You have to choose whether you're Republican, you have to choose if you're a Democrat, you have to choose if you support gay rights, you have to, everything is constantly being thrown at you in schools, at work. Every time there's a new movement about something at work, they tell you, you have to be considered of this, you have to be agreeing with this. So uh, what I find very satisfying is that in this place, whether people agree with it or not, there is not so much of that pressure coming down from the top. I haven't seen it. So if you ever wondered that if in Russia you were forced to have any ideology, well, here it is. Here's the proof that there's no, nobody's forcing you for anything. You could have a communist Soviet ice cream, or you could have a capitalist American ice cream. So Do which one will you pick? Well, I have both at home, so I, I take both. I don't choose sides. I went to war, but there's a comfort that you get after you survive. Misery becomes a, a part of you. And I thought that I needed to come here to be miserable and feel happy, but I just actually just became happy. I left to try to be miserable in Siberia to test myself. Like I said, I wanted to feel the cold, but I fell in love with the nature besides the woman. And you look for adventure to come back and say, look, look at my skin, look at my, my scars. I can tell you stories now, but now I don't feel like going back home and telling them about my, my battles here. Now I, this is my life. Usually the sun is going down by the time when it's the best fishing time. So I look at the, the mountains over there and I daydream about one day having kids really because I have no kids and I want to learn all these things so I could teach them teach them all my secret places and so they can live a little bit more more happy from the beginning because i didn't have this until i was in my 30s it might sound stupid but i think about how happy i am and yeah actually that's a very special place for me this is the lake one of my lakes that i fish all the time and uh, I hope you learned a little bit more about me. I mentioned there in the video that it wasn't just a woman that I fell in love with. I fell in love with the Russian spirit, the Russian soul, the, uh, the winter, the spring, the summer, the autumn, it, the, everything about that town. It really changed my life. I will be doing a part two. This, again, is the first episode with over 2 million views. The original link will be down below. Thank you so much for joining me. Goodbye, guys.